Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11057 Introduction to Law. This is week 10 in Term 3 2017. We're now into 2018. We're very much at the pointy end of the unit. During this unit, we've covered some basic introductory concepts. We've moved through some of the history of law. We've talked about some of the legal principles, um, contrasting law with equity, and um, uh, we've discussed briefly some of the court systems that apply in law. A major emphasis for me, this term, a unit, as has been the case in previous units, is all about legal research. And the, the idea of that is that if you can find the law, then you'll be able to make a good contribution about the law. Um, what I don't want is for people to work on a basis of memory. I'd rather you know how to find the law, access up-to-date materials. We've talked about the authorised reports, unauthorised reports. We've talked about how to um, consider a case using note-up facilities through Ostley, for example, and um, other research platforms that are available to you through the university site. From that, we've moved into issues about how you apply the law, how you apply your research, and um, we've talked about how you answer examination questions, look for the first word, for example, consider the difference between analyse and explore, or, or whatever the word might be, to commence a uh, question. So we're now at a stage where we're trying to tie things together. We're tying things together in two ways. The first is that through a few basic questions, we're going to generate some ideas on how you would go about answering legal problems and providing clients with legal advice. Typically, I, take the, I, I invite you to consider yourselves now as first-year lawyers working in a law firm or for a government um, uh, department and being asked to deal with certain issues that might arise. From that, we need to consider our legal research skills. We need to consider uh, jurisdictional issues. And we talked briefly about where you might take matters for court, how you might uh, decide which courts are appropriate to deal with which matters, uh, which tribunals are considered as well. But um, before we go into that in more detail, uh, which is what we're going to do tonight, we're going to continue on with our discussion from last week about a couple of concepts, I guess, that I've borrowed from medical terminology and um, methodology. Uh, you won't find these in the books. These are just things that I say. One is uh, talking about holistic legal advice, and the second is talking about legal triage. And we're trying to combine those two things. From that, we'll also talk about legal ethics and how you might going uh, go about answering legal issues in an ethical manner and conducting yourself in courts and tribunals in the appropriate way. So tonight I've got the chat facility open and I'm looking for contributions. Uh, please feel free to unmute your microphone or use the chat facility to contribute to the discussion. So let's talk about what I call this legal holistic advice and legal triage for want of better terms. What I'm really getting at is this that when you're confronted with a legal problem, you consider a range of options and don't restrict yourself only to a very legalistic, black letter law, if you like, litigation type approach. I think we've moved beyond that collectively in the legal profession. So we'll need to talk about legal options. We'll need to talk about things that you might do on an urgent basis while there's an opportunity to do so, which may not be available for too long. At the same time, we're considering the circumstances of the client, which um, might mean their intellectual, socio-economic uh, background, their age, cultural factors, risk perspectives, mental health issues, things of that nature. One thing that's very important that I think you need to consider essentially across the board are issues to do with capacity. And I know this is a topic that's very dear to, to Mary's heart in particular. It's certainly something that I'm very interested in because I'm a member of both the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, where I do a lot of guardianship work, administration work, and issues to do with the validity of powers of attorney. Um, and on the other hand, mental, mental health review tribunal, where there are also issues to do with the capacity of the patients that are being considered um, 
in the application. So capacity is an important issue always for you to consider because the advice that you give to someone who is intellectually disabled may be very different to the advice that you give to someone who is both um, uh, able intellectually and perhaps even experienced. Um, for example, and I'll just give you this example, uh, it may be that a client has a good case for defamation. However, it may be very difficult for someone to cope with the expense and the stress of litigation to pursue that defamation case where someone else may be perfectly capable of doing so. The other thing that you've got to consider in a general sense is who are you chasing and to what extent is it appropriate to continue to chase someone, for example, who has limited funds and is there a risk of um, running a great case, incurring a lot of expense for your client, obtaining a judgment in your client's favour, a costs order against the other side, only for the other side to immediately declare, declare bankruptcy. And you always run the risk then that your client may turn to you after two years and $100,000 of legal bills and say, what was the point of doing that? Because we've had a hollow victory. It's worth nothing to me. So what we need to do when I, when I talk about giving sort of this holistic advice, in some ways, or if they're on Centrelink, says Mary, in some ways requires you to look ahead, project ahead, look at best case scenarios, worst case scenarios, and raise those issues frankly and honestly with the client, providing the client with assessment of likelihood of outcome, but also asking the client to think about the big picture issues and determine whether it is an appropriate form of litigation to pursue. So in that sense, you are, as an advisor, I think, considering both legal and non-legal options that might be available to the client. Ultimately, it's up to the client to decide, but your job is to provide the range of options, provide an idea of the cost, give the clients an idea of what they might expect in going through that process, what it might cost, and um, ultimately, what might be the benefit or detriment to the client. <clears throat> All of that in the context of your legal obligations and ethics. <clears throat> so sometimes you need to involve yourself in early inter intervention strategies, and you need to consider different options. Now, we will talk more about legal ethics, but let me just pose this one to you. What if a client comes to you as a first-year lawyer offers to provide you with substantial funds to pursue a case, but you believe that the client is eligible for legal aid because the client says to you, look, I'm providing you these funds, but they're actually my parents' funds. They're not wealthy people, but they're willing to put everything they've got into the defence. And you think, well, this person who's charged with the offence could probably get legal aid and cost nothing. I mean, is that something that you need to consider? Do you need to explain these options? Mary says you should get them to apply for legal aid. What if your firm says, no, we don't do legal aid. We're not on the legal aid panel. Should you then say, no, I'm not going to accept your $50,000 as a defence fund to run your case. You are eligible for legal aid, so I, I suggest you go somewhere else. Maybe you take the case on in those circumstances. but. Um, and, and there's some questions coming, what type of lawyers would you get at Legal Aid? So I've been a Legal Aid lawyer for many years, both as a solicitor and a barrister, and I can say that um, the service that you get through Legal Aid in-house lawyers or um, Legal Aid preferred suppliers generally, I think in my experience, is very good. Certainly I always adopted the attitude that uh, irrespective of whether, whether I'm being paid through Legal Aid or privately, I give the same service. And I think many lawyers adopt that same approach. However, um, there are oftentimes firms that say the new lawyers will take on the legal aid issues. And we're getting a few comments about chat facilities there, but it's not necessarily the case. Sometimes you will get very senior lawyers. So these are just some examples of where you may need to consider factors which are not just out of the law textbook. And there might be some other issues that are relevant.
can you somehow provide assistance to the client in a cost-effective manner, which is less um, emotionally draining upon them than would be the case if they went to court. Let's take another example. <clears throat> a client comes to you and says, I want some advice in relation to a contract. Um, the contract provides that the buyer, that your client is going to buy a property and the company selling the property has provided a guarantee return of 10% per annum for five years. Do you then, before the client signs the contract, ask any further questions of the client to assist them in those circumstances? So do you understand the scenario? Somebody comes to you, I want to buy an investment unit, this looks good, I'm happy with the price, but what really I'm influenced by, the company that's developing the property and selling is going to give a guarantee of 10% per annum for five years. That looks like a great deal. Diane says, yes, you should ask some further questions or give some further advice. What sort of advice do you think you'd need to give someone? Michael suggests maybe they've inflated the price in order to provide that additional return. That might be the case. So you need to read the contract, says Mary. I agree with that. If just on that point of Michael's, maybe the price is inflated, what do you do about it? Michael's answer the question, encourage the client to get a valuation. The client can always say no, but at least you've covered yourself, you've covered your firm, and also uh, provided the uh, client with some good uh, information. On oh, Michael is yeah, in, in, this, uh, in, in this industry, so we understand. So have a look at the income and expenses of the unit over that time frame, says Diane. Does the fact that you're buying, your client is buying from a company rather than an individual have anything, any bearing on the advice that you give? Mary says yes. Diane says yes. Why well, would it have a bearing? What's the difference between buying from a company or an, an individual? What are the potential differences? Company directors. Directors can't be held to account personally. That's, a, that's an issue, non-accountability. So we've heard of $2 companies. Maybe the company that is developing, developing the property is actually a, merely a $2 trustee company and the assets are actually held by the trust and not the company. So maybe the company doesn't have much by way of assets. All right, so <clears throat> there are issues to do with misleading conduct. Diane says, well, maybe you should advise the client to undertake a company search, get some further information. That makes sense. So you can see that there are these issues. So let's assume, for example, that your client did proceed with the contract. You didn't provide any advice about undertaking company searches. You didn't say that the directors behind the company will not necessarily be personally liable for the obligations and guarantee of the company. The company goes into liquidation two years after the contract signed. Your client's return of 10% per annum is effectively useless for the last three years of the, um, of the, of the five-year guarantee. So they're not going to be too happy with you if you didn't ask them to at least explore these issues such as valuation, asking for personal guarantees, undertaking some company searches, um, making some in due diligence inquiries. So I think that's part of the role of a lawyer to do that. Even though the client might come to you specifically just for contract advice, I think you need to go beyond that in appropriate circumstances and consider other things, other factors, and maybe encourage the client to consider undertaking further searches or making further inquiries. The same thing applies for dispute resolution. Perhaps a, a client comes to you and says, I have a dispute, I wish to resolve the dispute. In the old days, we would just talk about litigation. That was it, that was the end, that was the only response. We'll go to court, we'll get the proceedings drawn. And that may be the right way to go. But is it the only way to go? Is it the best way to go? So dispute resolution services are provided by a number of providers. 
maybe we need to consider talking to the clients about those things. And then of course, if you do have a client that says, I do want to proceed to litigation, you need to know your courts, tribunals, you need to know monetary limits, you need to know which have equitable jurisdiction and which don't, you need to consider which have the capacity to provide interim orders, perhaps by way of injunctions or declarations that might enforce or protect the rights of your clients and you need to consider the jurisdictional aspects generally does this court or the tri or the or tribunal actually have the power to deal with this type of matter so last term last unit and the unit before i set difficult questions for the take home exam that ask the client or ask the students to consider all of these options use their legal research skills and come up with options for the client to consider in terms of being able to enforce their rights. And I'll post those past exams on UCREW for you to consider, but I'll do so with a caveat. The caveat is this, this unit, the take home examination is of a much less duration. As a result, the questions will be much easier and of a different format. So don't be overly concerned when you look at the uh, questions from last unit and say, how can I possibly answer that? Um, the, I did mark those with, on the basis that even though the students had a great deal of time to complete the answer, I acknowledge the high degree of difficulty. You won't have that high degree of difficulty this year. All right, I've been doing a lot of talking. Thanks for your patience. Let's see if we can share some information now. You're a first year lawyer, you're working in a law firm as a solicitor, a client comes to you as a result of a referral from one of the partners who've said, here, this is, you take this matter. And the client says, I want some assistance in relation to um, some issues that have gone wrong. And the issues are to do with a consumer debt or perhaps a debt recovery issue. So let's assume it's th those th sorts of things. I'll lump them together. Normally I separate them, but in the interest of time, I'll just say the client comes to you, it's either a consumer issue or it's a debt recovery issue, or maybe even both. What sort of options are available to the client to consider? I'll get you started. One is litigation. Diane says the ACCC. Okay, so what we're looking at there is introducing regulatory authorities that may provide some direct assistance to the client. One advantage of that, Diane, is, well, what are the, the advantages? QCAT's another. Lower costs, yes. Free, says Mary. What's the other advantage of going to say the ACCC or a regulatory authority? Costs is one thing. What else? <clears throat> you can represent yourself well in QCAT yes not at the ACCC well I suppose you can you can sort of work with the ACCC they can decide says Craig yes so what you're doing is you're introducing a third party decision maker Thomas says they have experts in the field that's an important point they get involved it's very specific to the inquiry but the waiting time can be longer, says Mary. All right, so regulatory authorities can provide some advantage. Also, of course, they have greater powers, typically. So they have powers which relate to investigations and prosecutions, um, powers that you won't necessarily have yourself if you went to court. Okay, so what else can you do? Litigation, you can go to a court or a tribunal, we'll explore which one later. You can complain to a regulatory authority as the, as a, um, such as the triple A, triple C. Okay, Diane says mediation. Jackie says conciliation. Great. All right, so we're, the common thread between mediation and conciliation is they're both forms of alternative dispute resolution. What's the difference between mediation and conciliation? And we'll come back to yours, Craig. Craig says, make a complaint to the company. That's very good. But we'll just explore this mediation, conciliation bit first. 
I've identified for you that they're both forms of alternative dispute resolution. What's the difference? Conciliators are more involved. Ah, Jackie, you're a conciliator. Mediation has a mediator who lets both parties have their say. Um, well, they do as well for conciliators. Jackie, do you want to tell us anything about mediation and conciliation? Unmute your microphone if you wish. Craig says mediators can't decide. Yes, that's a fair comment. Sorry, yes, it took me a bit to get it off. Sorry. No, you're right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm a conciliator with the Fair Work Commission in unfair dismissals. So one of the, our roles is to highlight strengths and weaknesses. In the case, we don't give advice. We can only highlight potential strengths and potential weaknesses and provide options around what um, applicants and respondents can do to try and get a resolution. Whereas mediation, it's a bit more hands-off. It's a bit more trying to get the parties to talk together to come up with a re resolution. So we're just, you know, we have a different approach, I guess, in some ways. Excellent. Thank you, Jackie. And if anyone has any questions of Jackie, I'm sure she'll be happy to <laughs> throw it a dob you in there, Jackie. That's all right. It's but fine. you're right. Um, so can I say this, that there is no one answer to what is mediation and no one answer to what is conciliation. There are differences. So a mediation can be made subject to different rules. In fact, to the point where it actually almost looks like a conciliation. And a conciliation can be very broad. Um, it can be certainly as Jackie described it, or it can actually go a bit further where the conciliator does have the power to make um, some suggestions and to explore options and perhaps even give some indication of, of an opinion about the legal position. So that can depend on the type of mediation or conciliation. And I think I've mentioned to you before that I do take um, laws 12062, alternative dispute resolution, a second year subject at the university. So if you decide to do an elective in ADR, uh, well, we'd love to see you. Okay, Craig says mediators can't decide and no lawyers in mediation. Well, it's not quite right. I, I kind of, I get the first one, but we do actually have lawyers representing parties in many mediations. Not always, depends on the nature of the mediation, depends on who's conducting it. So there might be the dispute resolution center, which is uh, typically annexed to a court, where the dispute resolution center says no lawyers, that's part of our rules. Um, but, in many mediations, we do have lawyers representing parties. Good area of work. If you want to represent parties in a mediation or a conciliation, Jackie, correct me if, if I'm wrong here, I think it's always a good idea to actually be a mediator or conciliator uh, so you better understand the process or at least know something about it so you know um, what mediators and conciliators can do. All right, so let's go back to a point that Craig raised a little while ago. And that was something about, what was it, Craig? You said, go directly to the company. Was that it? Okay. So go directly to the company. Let's, let's keep a, a track of this. So far, we've talked about these options. Litigation. We've talked about ADR, which is mediation and conciliation. We've talked about going to regulatory authorities and seeing if they can assist. And Craig says, just go straight to the company. So I'd call that make a direct approach. I think that's a valid tactic. It's never easy to do. Sometimes clients need some encouragement, but often I would suggest it is the best way to resolve a dispute. What if it's a dispute involving a neighbor? Would you ever recommend making a direct approach. What are some of the advantages? What are some of the pitfalls in a neighborhood dispute about recommending a direct approach? What are some of the things that you need to ask? Depends on the dispute. Yep, I agree with that. Depends on the circumstances. Depends on the past history. Yes. Relationship breakdown can always be tricky. Can be horrible if they go, if they go legal which might mean um, that it's better to try and keep it away from legal remedies because they can really blow up. 
you'd probably want to know if there's been some sort of order, um, restraint order under the Peace and Good Behaviour Act or domestic violence. So you don't want to encourage someone to uh, move into a situation where in fact they're either breaching an order that's been made against them or they're um, ignoring an order which was being put in place to their protection. Um, so you may, it can escalate and it may be that whilst the direct approach in many ways is good, you know, the advice of let's see if we can sort things out over a cup of tea or a beer, it, it's sometimes very valid. So I'm going to put down make a direct approach as a different option available for you to at least consider discussing with your client in terms of this holistic advice. What else have we got? Any other ideas? I think we're up to four now. We can do better than that. Let's say the debt recovery dispute involves your client chasing money from her daughter, $50,000. <clears> Any other options that might be available? Forget about it. That's, yeah. I'm going to put that down. So Diane says forget about it. I'm putting that down as fifth option. Walk away from the dispute. I think it's a valid thing to discuss with the client. Talk about the amount of money. Acknowledge that it's substantial, but also, and that the issues of concern are of importance because people do appreciate, they don't want to be fobbed off. They want to be acknowledged. You, they want you to acknowledge that the amount of money is, involved, is substantial, that there are issues of concern. Diane's come up with a good idea. Maybe we avoid all this by rearranging the will. That's a good tactic. That's cost, that costs not much to do, and it avoids a lot of acrimony. You can always get the money back through your will. You have to talk to them about the possibility of making a challenge to that will, so you might want to document the reasons why you've changed the will but maybe that's a good idea. Um, so I'm not, you won't necessarily recommend it, but I think you should discuss it as an option that's available to the client. Right, so that's five options. Is that it or have we got more? We talked about the ACCC. I'm putting that down as an investigative regulatory body. Sometimes there are adjudicative investigative, sorry, adjudicative bodies that do some investigation as well, as opposed to a body like the ACCC, which has the prosecutorial arm. Are there any investigative bodies that might assist your client in coming to a resolution? Consumer Affairs, yep, that type of thing. The Office of Fair Trading, um, that's it, I like that. What about Ombudsman? What do ombudsmen do and how, where are there ombudsmen? Do we have different types of ombudsmen depending on the industry? So it's government, yes, we do, different types. Can anyone name one or two ombudsmen? Telecommunications, oh, that was good. you were very quick on that. Uh, insurance, yes, fair work ombudsman, health ombudsman. Okay, and the government ombudsman generally. So insurance ombudsman, banking industry ombudsman, telecommunications industry, government ombudsman generally, um, energy consumer protection. So it's a range of different options available to you through ombudsman. What that means is that you need to be aware of how to contact these ombudsmen, be able to give your client advice uh, and say, how, do, how about you consider this? You need to consider what's involved for the client, what what that will cost in order to generate an option. What you don't want to do is take on a banking dispute, the client spends twenty, thirty thousand dollars and then finds out down the pub that somebody had a similar dispute and they resolved it through the banking ombudsman. Knock, knock, knock. Why didn't you tell me about the banking ombudsman when I first came to see you? So you can see that there's a degree of assistance to the client, but there's also issues to do with you're protecting your own reputation, protecting the reputation of your firm and complying, fulfilling your legal obligations because the legal ethics side of things comes into play as well. All right, there are other bodies such as the Office of the Public Guardian that um, 
has an opportunity to investigate, uh, particularly say in powers of attorney, welfare rights, um, there's a seniors legal service, there are other organisations that might help. When it comes to suing, usually, and someone did write this down and I'm just trying to see who it was, yes, Mary made a point, a letter of demand. The significance of a letter of demand is that if you do send a letter of demand, perhaps through a solicitor, Mary makes the point that might be enough and it might be. But there's another reason to do it. And that is that if you choose to sue without having sent a letter of demand, you run a risk. And the risk is that the clients will, the other side will say, look, if you'd only asked, I would have paid. You didn't have to sue. So I'm not going to pay the legal costs and the filing fees associated with suing. You didn't give me a letter of demand. So by sending a letter of demand, you're actually protecting yourself in that sense. All right. Um, other things that you could consider going to your member of parliament and making a complaint, maybe through political means, you can resolve the issue. If you're really keen, you can consider the media. Um, that's always fun when you come out of court and you have the media come at you. Um, another way is a thing called statutory demands. Does anyone know what a statutory demand is? Ever come across that? It's a very, it's a very aggressive way to recover a debt. It's a, it's a formal notice served on a company requiring payment within 21 days. And if a company fails to comply or fails to make an application to the court to set it aside, then that is a presumed insolvency. And you can use that presumption of insolvency to wind the company up. So it's a very aggressive procedure. You can actually proceed on that basis without having secured a judgment prior to the event, or you can secure a judgment and then use that statutory demand procedure. All right, so we've talked about a number of options. Thank you for, for your participation. I lost count after about four or five, but what you'll need to do is create for yourself a list of options that you might wish to consider discussing with your client and build on that as you go, um, because the options will be different depending on the nature of the dispute. Um, that you are embarking upon. All right, let's see if we can tie things a bit more together. We've talked about generating disputes, uh, options for disputes. We've talked about going to courts and tribunals. Let's look at these examples. Number one, your client wishes to pursue a debt of $5,000. Which court, which tribunal, or is there more than one? Where would you, and the client says, all right, thanks for all your advice, but I want to litigate this. I want to go to court or tribunal. It's $5,000. Where do you go to pursue that? And you can answer for your own state if you're interested. We're all very quiet. QCAT or Yep, or MAG court. Yep, I agree with that, Diane. And in QCAT, there are the two jurisdictions. There's the minor civil disputes jurisdiction, and there's the jurisdiction, which is much bigger, much broader, which is everything other than minor civil disputes in QCAT. So which one do you go to in QCAT if it's a $5,000 debt? Minor civil disputes? Typically, yes. Um, <clears throat> but if the debt relates to an issue to do with a power of attorney, then you may wish to challenge the power of attorney or the actions of the um, uh, the party exercising those um, entitlements. And that would be a different thing in QCAT. Or you can go to the magistrate's court. So generally, yep, I, I agree with that. What if your client wants to pursue a debt of $50,000? Where would you go for that? Mag court. Mag court, yep, I think so. What if it's a building dispute? District. Why district? Mm, I don't know. I just said it. <laughs> <laughs> to distinguish it from magistrate's court. It was the first one that came to your mind. That's a oh, fair answer. <laughs> That's a fair answer. You can actually go to the Supreme Court or the District Court even for $50,000, but you run the very real risk that if you're successful, the court will only order that you um, uh, are paid on the scale appropriate to the magistrate's court and you can expect 
the court will not be happy with you for bringing the matter to the uh, incorrect court. But you can try it, you can do it. Um, if it's a building dispute, a domestic building dispute, you may well go to QCAT, not the minor civil disputes jurisdiction of QCAT, but QCAT generally. Um, and in that sense, QCAT has unlimited jurisdiction. So if you're arguing about a domestic building dispute and the amount of um, damages is $500,000, uh, you can still go to QCAT for that. All right, so what if your client says, I want to sue as a result of a faulty refrigerator, it's worth $2,000, we'd go to the minor civil disputes in QCAT, Q consumer dispute, what do you think, Diane? Um, I had QCAT and the ACCC. Yep, yep, of course, ACCC is where you can make a complaint, but it's not necessarily a court or a tribunal to determine the matter, okay. but they can pursue the matter. Um, okay. They can assist in re a resolution. Okay. What if you had a faulty motor vehicle worth $30,000? Where would you go for that? No thoughts? QCAT, Magistrates, Ombudsman. So a range of answers there. Um, yeah, probably the Magistrates Court, but that will depend. Probably the District Court, maybe not. They might complain. What's the different, What's the jurisdictional limit, the difference between the Mag Court and the District Court? What's the threshold, the number? Mm. We don't know? Seven and a half in Western Australia, says Michael. I don't know about Western Australia. Uh, 75,000. Oh, 75. Oh, sorry. It is, yeah. Sorry, 75. It's more than that in Queensland. You've got 125 from Queensland. 150, I think. 150. Yeah, I knew it was a lot more. Yep. Mm. Craig got 150. Yep. What's the difference between, what's jurisdiction, jurisdictional boundary between district and supreme in Queensland? It's up to 750 in WA. It's yeah, 750 in West WA, 750 in Queensland as well. Yeah. Um, so, but as I said, if, you know, if you had a, a million dollar retail shop lease dispute, which is within the QCAT jurisdiction, then you go to QCAT still. So QCAT uh, in its general jurisdiction and the Supreme Court in Queensland are unlimited in their monetary values, just depends on the nature of the dispute. So I guess the point that I'm really trying to make is, that there are a whole range of different places that you might want to pursue matters. What if you're suing for an anti-discrimination matter? Where would you go for that? To the Anti-Discrimination Commission? Yep, or Fair Work. I think that's, that's close to your heart, Jackie. So, um, yes. So what you need to do is be aware of the special jurisdictions that are available for different courts and tribunals, and then proceed from there. Okay, well, thank you for participating in that, and it does depend on the situation. All right, now when it comes to ethics, I'm sure you've all read very carefully chapter 13. Did I upload for you the um, material from His Honour Judge Morzone before he was appointed? I had a session with Judge Morzone. Yes, you did. I did? Okay, good. Um, I'd commend the um, material on courtroom ethics. If you want a very good, clear guide as to what you're expected to do in court and how you go about dealing with court matters, that's excellent, excellent reading. Has anyone read that from uh, that material from Judge Ah, uh, Yeah. Okay. Any questions arise from it or comments, Michael? Not really. Okay. It's all pretty straightforward, but very mm. good. Um, so the other thing is, and I mentioned this, I think last time, the QLS, the Queensland Law Society Ethics Centre, um, it's excellent. I won't go to the website, but I'll ask you to, to look at that yourself if in ha you haven't already done so. And um, you'll note that there are guidance statements which outline solicitors' ethical obligations in subject areas. Uh, we talked uh, previously about undertakings, but there's obligations for ongoing cost disclosures and uh, other issues of importance. So that's the um, annotated solicitor's conduct rules. And it's quite thick. If you don't, if you can 
you have to pay for this publication, but it's excellent because it has some um, annotations and case notes and uh, it's excellent. The barrister's uh, conduct rules, which are known as the um, barrister's rule, is a much smaller publication that's un unannotated. So there's um, less in terms of the rules for their, um, barristers as there are for solicitors. So Mary's talking about um, uh, some of the ethics associated with being in court. And um, yep, you've got to be careful how you present yourself in court, what you wear. Uh, and also just a tip, if you're in court, the microphones are mm -hmm. super sensitive and it's amazing uh, from when I do sit on the bench in QCAT, it's amazing what you pick up, what you can see and what you can hear in a court. So just be very aware of um, how you how you deal with uh, your client and your colleagues in court because the bench can pretty much hear everything that goes on. All right, so when you're looking at the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, I, and I urge you to do so, I'm not saying that's an exam hint, but it kind of is, um, you need to be aware of some of the fundamental duties of say solicitors contained in rules three, four, five, and six. You need to consider the issue of obligations that uh, solicitors have when dealing with their clients. So have a look at uh, rules through six, sorry, seven through to 16. And in particular, have a look at uh, rule 8.1, which is an obligation to follow the client's lawful, proper and competent instructions. So you can see that I've emphasized those three words your obligation, do what the client wants you to do. But from what we talked about in the first stage of tonight, make sure that you have explained all the options and the likely costs and risks before the client says, this is what we're going to do. But once the client says, this is what I want you to do, then what you have to do is follow the client's one, lawful, two, proper, and three competent instructions. So if the client says to you, I want you to restructure this contract so that we can avoid paying stamp duty, which you say is lawfully payable, then you can't follow those instructions because that would be unlawful. You're participating in something that's unlawful. Also, the instructions have to be proper. I instruct you to set to contact the local kickboxing organization and um, engage three kickboxers to go around and uh, send a message to my neighbor who's annoying me. You know, that's just not proper. It's probably illegal as well. Um, so the instructions have to be proper and the instructions have to be competent. So, and I know Mary would be very careful with this to ensure that the client does have the appropriate capacity, intellectual understanding to provide you with the instructions in a competent manner. <clears throat> so that's 8.1. Um, also, when you're looking at the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, have a look at advocacy and litigation rules, which are 17 to 29. In particular, have a look at rule 21.2. And 21.2 provides that a solicitor must take care to ensure that decisions by the solicitor to make allegations or suggestions under privilege against a person are reasonably justified and are appropriate for the advancement of the client's case. And you're not doing something just to primarily harass or embarrass a person. As a solicitor, if you're involved as an advocate in that role, your client may say, look, I want you to really get stuck into these people and um, ask them some really difficult questions. If those questions don't advance the client's case, then you don't ask the questions, even though the solicitor, the client has asked you to answer those questions. All right, for the Australian, uh, for the barrister's rule, um, which is 2001, but amended in 2016, you should um, try and obtain a copy and have a look at some of the advocacy rules, which are 12 to 14, duty to the court rules, duty to the client rules, and responsible use of court process.
you don't need to know these things in detail, but I think it's important that you're aware of the rules that apply to practitioners, whether they're solicitors or barristers in Queensland. If you're interstate, then you can look at your own rules. You can look at your own rules. You don't have to worry about the Queensland rules. You're welcome to do so if you like, because if there is a question about legal ethics in the examination and you quote the rules that are appropriate to your state, and I'll see which state you're in, then I would rather you did that and made the learning that you do relevant to you rather than necessarily um, learning qu rules in Queensland that will have much less practical um, bearing for you. So does that make sense? So even though it might say something about Queensland or you think that the question might relate to Queensland, feel free just to make it, maybe just make a note at the, the, the top answer this based on New South Wales law or Western Australian law or whatever it is, then just go for it as if it's your state. Okay. Um, so in your text, there were some really good discussions about ethical issues. Have a look at page 460 about the ethical issues and some of the duties. That ties in with some of those rules that I mentioned for the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules. Have a look at page 467 of your text, and in particular, the commentary about Parker and Evans. Maybe this is where I borrowed some of those things because Parker and Evans say you do need to take a holistic view of your clients um, and their problems and talk about their relationships and look for those non-adversarial ways to resolve disputes. All right, so, I think that's probably all we should cover tonight. The, during this week, I'll be busily answering, um, up, uh, marking papers, providing feedback, and also um, providing some information, which I'll drip feed about the examination and give you some further hints. You've actually had a few hints tonight. I'm sure you picked up on some of those things. All right, any questions before we wrap up for this evening? Oh, in the past exams. Thank you, Mary. I must do that. All right. Well, thank you very much for your patience. Um, please continue the excellent discussions through you, crew. Remember to keep answering the questions which are uh, set for the weekly problems. I appreciate we're not going through them, but uh, always a good idea to do that. Okay. All the best, and we will see you next week. Bye then.